good morning and welcome to worship at North Springfield Presbyterian Church. A couple of hospitality notes to point out. There's a gender neutral bathroom right behind this wall. And following the service, we'll have coffee hour, which is in the building if you just head straight down the road. It's in that big building there. Some announcements in the life of the community is we are getting ready to have our annual um, show. I don't know if we call it a talent show, but um, our, the show of the year. You don't want to miss out. So, and it's called the... Night at the Moonlight Lounge, yeah, that sounds good, right? Exciting. Um, and on Monday, uh, the reservations are due. So if you haven't reserved yet, um, please do so. We'd like to have all of you there. Are there any other announcements in the life of the community? Okay. Let's put it this way, you've already had a good morning, so hi, y'all. <laughs> anyway, this is a message from the deacons. First question is, what is a deacon? A deacon is dependable, uh, energetic, active, concerned, organized, and needed in our church. Not just in our church, but in every church. Uh, I need to let you know that the deacons here don't just do the dishes in the kitchen. We clean the kitchen, we clean the nursery, we restock the kitchen, we give out bus passes, we give out grocery cards, we bring in food, we visit the the homebound, we visit our special care people in nursing homes, hospitals, et cetera, and take them communion. Um, <clears throat> we would like to thank the members of this congregation for the donation in offering that you people have been making over the last few months on the first Sunday of the month because that goes to let us buy extra grocery cards and do a little bit of, a few extra things. Um, deacons are not just women. We have one token gentleman, but we, will, we, we would be happy to have any more. This, if you have questions, the seated board of deacons right now consists of Cheryl Cullison, Rick Haynes, Pat Harper, Jan Conrad, Katie Beard, Sam Grace, Barb Shaw, and myself. I'm not sure if I left anybody out because some of the deacons that I normally say, yeah, Allison, well, Allison isn't sitting back there. That's why I was going to say, I was going by who is here, but yes, Allison Cohen is our most recent. Um, and I learned that not too awfully long ago. Once a deacon, always a deacon. So we appreciate that. But again, I would like to say thank you so very much for your offerings, contributions that you make to the deacons. And I hope that you will continue to do the same and appreciate what the deacons are doing for everybody that we can and Please feel free to come to us if there's someone you'd like us to visit or something that you would like us to do because we will serve in special dinners and so forth. Thank you. Ricky is our token male. Big red over there.
to logistical constraints, I will be doing the liturgy from way over here. <laughs> Please rise if you are comfortable. Let us join in the call to worship. God is love. Hear now the assurance of forgiveness. Friends, hear the good news, because we serve a God who is love. You are forgiven, and may now be at peace.
Today's first reading will be Psalm 22, verses 25 through 31. It can be found in your pew Bible on page 485. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it.
<clears throat> say that um, the choir does my sermon and that I might just walk out, I might actually do it uh, pretty soon. <laughs> like I can't follow that. <laughs> um, just get my benediction and go to coffee hour. <laughs> well, I, I already prepared a sermon for today, so <laughs> we'll have to wait for one of the days when I, when I didn't <laughs> or couldn't. The second reading today comes from 1 John, so that's towards the back of your Bible. It's not the Gospel of John, but it's towards the back. And it says, Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God, and everyone who loves is born from God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide, or remain, in him and he in us because he has given to us his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this day, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, And whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. Amen. Has anybody picked up on the theme for today's sermon? Love, Love, right? It's just been all over everywhere. Does anybody have any favorite songs or hymns that deal with love? Yep, that's a good one. We're going to sing it later. Did you pick that up? The, yeah, bulletin. You just look at the bulletin. Yeah, that's good. So it's handy. Just like read over the bulletin. Be like, oh yeah, I knew that. Love is a wonderful thing. Good. Yeah. What? Hmm. Yes. Again, the bulletin. It's so helpful. <laughs> yeah. No, but that's one of my favorites too. Anybody else? There you go. Love is blue? Okay. It didn't have words to it. Just a feeling. You just look at it and get a feeling. That's fine. Anybody else? No one else has favorite songs. That's okay. That's a good one. Endless love, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, those are all good, um, good things, good songs to come up with, right? So here's another thing. When you, this, this is a really unique passage because it kind of goes from, yeah, that feels like warm and mushy and nice to, oh, why did he put that in there? To, yay, God is love because he repeats it like 15,000 times, Right? And then there'll be another thing that's like, uh, I don't know if I like that part. That sounds impossible or menacing 
or ominous or I just don't want to do it. Can we just go back to the God is love part? And yes, you can because that's always what he says after he says something else. It's always there. So when you heard this passage, was there anything that kind of disturbed you a little bit? Yeah, okay, that's a little like, mm, what is that? What do we do with that? What does that mean? Yeah, that's something that, that can be a bit troubling. What about if you hate your sister or brother, you don't know love? That's an interesting point. Um, but f- for me, that was the first thing when it's, if you don't love your brother or sister, or you hate your brother or sister, you don't know love. And what is our definition for love in this passage? God, that's right. It's very simple and feels, at least to me, that feels very comforting. God is love. Who is God? God is love, right? And one of the things that can be difficult is sometimes when we're in a very stressful situation, maybe some bad things have happened, we don't know if we can recover from it. I want a God who, yes, the love is great, but I want a God who is more of an avenger, who can come in and set things right and does lightning from the sky and all of those things, turns over some tables. Yeah, that's great that God is love and loves me, but I'd really prefer God to come in and, like, set things right. I'd like that kind of God. Or maybe you are in, in, sorry, my accent pops out every now and then, you are in a situation where you have been sick for a long time and you think surely God is a healer. I want God to come in and heal me. God is a healer. But that's not what this passage says. It says God is love. So the passage doesn't say God is like love or God chooses to use love or God is just plain lovely. It says God is love. And those who don't know love don't know God. If you hate your sister or brother, you can't say you have love because then you're lying. And, you know, I'm Cuban and I have times when something happens and I get disgruntled with somebody. And they may not be at the top of my list. And so when I was preparing the sermon and read this passage, it was a good reminder. If you want to say that you love, if you want to say that you know God, you can't hate your brother or your sister. And this text was written to the early Christian community. We think this letter was written about 60 to 70 AD. And so within this community, and if you notice, John, we think it was the same person who did the Gospel of John. He's not speaking to people outside the Christian community. He's speaking to that particular community and how they treat each other in the community, sisters and brothers. I'm going to assume maybe not all of us, but a few of us from time to time may have a sister or brother we wish might stay home a day or two from church. Or maybe that's just me. (laughs) But nobody here, I love everyone here, just, you know. This is a full passage because it is so full of love, yet it is so demanding. Like, if you say you hate your brother or sister, you're lying. If you say that you know love, 
And if you don't have love, who do you not know? God. And that's why this passage is just layered and layered with things. And it can be very easy to just skate over some of these things and just concentrate on God is love because he says it so many times. And as I was reading through the passage, I would read it, oh, God is love, two stanzas down, God is love, 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 God is love. And that's lovely and comforting. But it's like he goes from one of the most comforting things to the hardest things at the same time and holds them in tension. Does anyone want to show off their Greek this morning and tell me uh, any of the words in Greek that mean love? Agape. Good. Anybody else? There's three that are pretty common. Eros. Yes, so Eros is um, like physical attraction. Philo. Yes, okay. Melissa, you win today. You win the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Philo is uh, friendship love. Agape is perfect love. God loves us with agape love, which is the unconditional and perfect love. And how do we know that God is love and that God loves us? Okay, God sent a guy. <clears throat> right, so... God, in his most perfect action of love, sends his son, his only begotten son, to come and atone for our sins. And in this community, because there's a 30-year gap, there are probably some people who were at the crucifixion or who remember it very clearly. This is enough time where people have been born that they would not have remembered actually being there for the crucifixion. But there were people who were, who remember seeing Jesus on the cross and how people gambled for his clothes. There were some people who might even have heard the thief on one of the other crosses who Jesus said, you will be in my kingdom. They remember having Jesus pulled down from the cross and taken his body and burying his body. And this isn't in the scriptures exactly, but there were probably people who cleaned his wounds, who washed his body as in the Jewish tradition when you do a burial. And who wrapped his body and left very sad. Because that is some of the ultimate sadness you can feel when the person you are following who was teaching you and loving you and who you had been through so much with and seen him. Or you were somebody who passed down the stories because you wanted the younger generation to learn what that was like, and appreciate that gift. But almost even more than that, God shows his love with an empty what? An empty tomb. Because if it had only been that Jesus died for us, that would be amazing. But the fact that he was raised from the dead, I don't know anybody else who has been raised from the dead. There's Jesus. Well, there's another story about somebody else in the Bible, but we won't do that one today. <laughs> and here's the thing about this agape love, this perfect love. It is restless, it is creative, and it gives birth. If anybody remembers in John 3, Nicodemus goes to Jesus and says, how does one be born again? And this love, God is love, is also a birthing love, a creative love. God is love. 
And if you hate your brother or sister, you don't know God. Because God is love. We are not perfect. And agape is perfect love. But the scriptures tell us, even in our imperfection, to try to. To do the best we can. To achieve that perfect, unconditional love for people. God is love. I think it's one of the warmest statements and one of the hardest statements that we have in Scripture. God is love. And in the scripture, it talks about this. So how does this love thing with God work? We already talked about how God shows that God is love and loves us. So what happens first? We love God and God loves us back? Or God loves us and then we love God? Was that for someone? Yes. Okay. Mhm. Sometimes I just don't like them. Mhm. That's a good question. So, according to this scripture, it says if you hate your sister or brother, you you don't know God. I would say for your situation, that's something I would really pray about and see what God has to say to you concerning that. It, like I said, it's a, hard, it's a hard passage. And I just really wanted to skip over. It's like it goes every other line. And I just wanted to skip over all that. If you don't love, you hate God. I just did because it feel, maybe it doesn't feel hard to you, but it feels hard to me. Because just like Priscilla said, well, there was something that happened, and so I didn't say I hated them. I just said I don't like you much right now. But you still love them. Yeah. And the scriptures also tell us that hate and love can't abide or remain together. Anger and love can. We have the example of Jesus who turned over the tables in the temple who was angry. But hate and love cannot be together because God is love and God does not hate. If you hate your sister and your brother or your brother and or I guess you don't know love and God is love. And the scripture says, therefore, you don't know God. I have to admit that with this letter, when I was reading it, it kind of felt like John was being a bit egotistical. Like John never didn't uh, like anybody. Or John didn't ever hate anybody. I mean, the Romans were oppressing them. This is the same setting for Acts that we've been studying. Right? The Roman Empire is, is in control. They're oppressing the Christian communities. They're angry. They don't see them as Christians. They just see them as extensions of the Jewish religion. And they're angry because they're destroying the Pax Romana or the peace of Rome that Rome had worked so hard to do. And the Roman citizens love it. But the Christians are just messing everything up. Because they won't pay tribute to Caesar in the way the Romans would like. So if I was in that situation, I might kind of hate the emperor or a Roman soldier. But in this passage, it's talking about sisters and brothers. I don't think it means, I don't think it gives us permission to hate people who are not our sisters and brothers. But this is specifically 
for that community, just like it might have been written specifically for our community that dwells together. God is love. And another thing that's hard is that perhaps we just feel like we have hit the end of our rope. We may have lost so much money to medical bills or just the consequences of the way our system works. Are you going to buy food or are you going to buy medicine? You can't afford both. And you're tired. And it's stressful. And you may want God to be, instead of love, to have a God that says God is prosperity. Yeah, I like that one. Or we have people who are on television who like to propagate that. Joel Ovaltine. Does anybody remember when we've brought that up before? Yeah? Right? Happy to take your money and tell you all is good and you have a blessing. And he smiles all the time. Pretty teeth. And if you are completely at the end of everything, you may think, well, maybe I will give $20 as my love gift or my seed bunny. Because he tells me that it might return to me threefold or a hundredfold or whatever. So maybe I just might do that because I don't know what else to do. Maybe God is a God who blesses you when you send money. And I don't have very much blessings because I don't tend to send any money into the folks who are on TV. So there are all these different things that at times we want God to be. But the way that God has defined God in this passage is that God is love. Now, that doesn't mean that God is not generous or prosperous or blesses us. But those are actions. Love is also an action. But it is the definition in this passage. God is love. And then to think about how going back to agape and that that is perfect love. Yeah, that sounds good. I was happy when I read that. God has perfect, unconditional love for me. So when I mess up, it's fine. It's not a problem. God still loves me. But then you get to that other stanza. Sorry, I'm using, the choir was so good today. I guess I'm using, uh, and then when you get to the half note, you want to look in. Sorry. (laughs) Um, But then you get to the other portion of that. which tells us, I'm doing this just like how John did it and repeating each thing over and over. I guess it was so important, he felt like we needed to really get it. Or he may have forgotten what he wrote two sentences before. That can happen sometimes when you're public speaking or you're preaching and you forget what you've said and then you just say it over and over. So I don't know which one it is, but that's what he did. But that part about doing your best to love with agape love. I'd always heard that that wasn't possible. We couldn't even try that. Because we're human and we're not perfect. Therefore, we cannot have perfect love. And that is true. But in this passage, it says to strive for it. Even if it's imperfectly, to strive for it. And the more that we strive to have agape love and to show it, the better we get at it. And we know that we have truly made some changes and are moving forward. When we find another person And we share that the best we can, the imperfect agape love. 
and it catches on to them like wildfire. And their heart becomes changed. Because someone tried as best they could to love them with that imperfect love. It's also really easy to do when you know someone loves you or likes you, right? That's super easy to love that person back, especially here because we're kind of huggy, right? Just be like, peace be with you, uh, you know. And if there's somebody that you kind of just want to, don't feel like talking to at the moment, it's easy enough. You can just sort of stay in your own contained circle. You don't have to do that. But the hardest thing to do is to love the unlovely. To love the person who you know may not love you back. Who you know may not even want you to love them. Who maybe maybe somebody who doesn't even want God to love them. And that is the hardest thing is to love the unlovely, the vulnerable and the marginalized. God is love. God is agape love. God loved us so much that God sent God's son to be crucified and he died. I grew up in church and I heard it so much that it began to take on kind of a normal meaning. I really don't know how to explain that. Like, yeah, Jesus died for our sins. It's, we're just having some technical difficulties. Don't worry. We're not being invaded by aliens or anything. So it's difficult to love the most unlovely. But that is how we begin to reflect that agape love within us. When we know that we can strive to love the most unlovely person that we know, even though it may not change a thing for that person, but it changes us. And that is what God meant to do when God sent Jesus, when we ended up with an empty tomb, when Jesus came back and appeared to them in several different ways, depending on which gospel you read, and told them, that he was going to send a comforter for them. God is love. He took care of all those things. The sacrifice for sin, the empty tomb to show that Jesus had conquered the grave, and leaving the Holy Spirit with us so that we know that God abides or remains within us. And that we abide or remain with God. Please pray with me. God of perfect, unconditional love. We give you thanks for the love that you have for us. Because even before we were formed... You loved us. Even before we could speak our first word, you loved us. And even before we could say, oh, yeah, Jesus died for my sins, you loved us. And that you are love and you relentlessly pursue us, calling us back to you, loving us even in our failings. You are love. Amen.
Good job, everybody. Would you please join me in the affirmation of faith? We trust God, whom Jesus called Abba Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and Please join me in prayer. Gracious and merciful God, we thank you that you hear our prayers, that you are love. And today we ask that you let that love flow through all of these situations. We ask that you bring comfort where comfort is needed, peace where peace is needed, wisdom where wisdom is needed, protection where protection is needed. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Nope, not yet. to see who would remember. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Please pray with me the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would the ushers now prepare to receive the offering?
please join me in the prayer of dedication. Holy Lord, you have perfected love among us, ascending your Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. We humbly acknowledge your gift is an overwhelming pronouncement of grace. We share these tithes and offerings today with the hope that your children everywhere will be anointed with the knowledge that your perfect love casts out all fears. Amen. Thank you. As you leave this place today, may you remember God is love. May you remember that as we work towards achieving that perfect love, that we should do it the best we can, even though it's imperfect. So working on imperfectly achieving perfect love. As you go out from this place, may you give strength to the weak, voice to those who are silent. May you see one another. May you hear one another. And may you love one another. Because it's all that easy and it's all that hard. And now by the perfect love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the comfort of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. Amen. Amen.